Test, test. Yo. So, um, I've been encouraged to try and do vlog, so I'm gonna do what this. Let's call it vlog. I figure it's a good time because uh, me coming out of the football atmosphere and people that know me on social media nowadays as a former football player who's trying to make music. Some people wrote me on messages saying, yeah, maybe I should say something about this whole Super League thing with uh, the six Premier League teams and my club, Barcelona, or my favorite club as a fan, Barcelona, Real Madrid, the clubs from uh, Italy, and so on, right? And I think um, before anybody really uh, formulates an opinion, I think everybody should try at least look at the situation from every perspective first so that at least if you have an understanding of what each side is asking for then it's probably easier to try and find a solution so i think the best thing probably do is like to start from the perspective of the people who want the super league right that would be the mainly the owners of these clubs and everybody says it's the rich you know it's rich the rich people that's why they own these clubs but then, uh, yeah, I think there's been partial information I think that's been given out. And then yesterday, Florentino Perez, who's supposed to be the president of the Super League, came out and made a statement about how you know, he made a statement about what he what his reasons are for, for doing it. I think he's not really good at explaining himself, or maybe I just didn't read the correct, the proper reports that were giving his point of view fairly. But, I mean, the bottom, bottom line for them is what in people in business call the bottom line. You have to make revenue and <clears throat> you have to look at it like uh, from a business perspective. If somebody takes over a business, you don't do it with the intention of losing money, which is the weird thing, because that's what a lot of people kind of come into come into the business of football ownership intend to do is to lose money in order to win trophies. And this is something that I think a lot of fans have come to expect that if you come and basically take over our club, you're doing so with the fact that you, 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 with the belief that you love our club so much that you're willing to lose money in order to give us the gratification of winning trophies. It's an expectation that a lot of people have had for a long time now. And I think it's part of the culture here in Europe, at least. And uh, it's somewhat unsustainable. So if you look at the way football clubs have been run over the past decade or more, it's gotten to the point where clubs are now trying to outspend each other to win so that they can have bragging rights, so to speak. And the only clubs that are able to do that and, and still have some type of uh, financial ability to continue uh, going are the clubs that are owned by mega rich people. So you're looking at your PSG, you're looking at your um, Manchester City, you're looking at you know clubs that are owned by people with basically bottomless pits of money. And the rest of people are trying to keep up, and it's become difficult. And I think it's funny, uh, Florentino Perez said yesterday that he didn't invite PSG to join their Super League, or they didn't invite PSG to join their Super League. And the irony is that when PSG bought out Neymar's clause from, P- from uh, Barcelona, it pretty much catapulted the cost of living of being a football owner. Because now the asking price was what was deemed before impossible to do that's why the clause in Neymar's contract say okay we'll charge you 200 million euros to take this guy away from us thinking that nobody would be would even dare to think about doing it and then somebody goes ahead, goes ahead and do, does it and then all of a sudden everybody's saying well if he costs that much then we want somewhere in the, in the same range for a player who's you know this uh, this much in comparison to what Neymar is worth and it just kind of raised the standards of what it costs to buy a player and that just killed people. And then next thing you know, it's like a, it was like an arms race. Oh, well, if you want that much, we want that much. And then everybody just kept going. Everybody kept going. And boom, pandemic came in. Whoosh, just fucked everybody. So now, all these people that have been in this arms race are kind of like, well, how do we make up all this money that we've been spending? Because we're losing a lot more money than we expected to be earning after buying all these players. And now they're stuck. And now they're in a position where they're desperate to make revenue. And this desperation is where they are now. 
and why they put themselves in a position where they want to start a league where they can make more revenues in a time where revenue is now starting to be spread across the entire, let's say, European continent when it comes to European football. Uh, the other thing is you got to look at the other teams that are on that list. Look at Arsenal, you look at Tottenham, you think to yourself, why are they there? And at the end of the day, it's really just about who... Who's, who's trying to find the easiest way to get themselves to glory financially? And who has the fan base to believe that if they're playing for an international fan base, people will tune in to watch them play so that they can make more money. And that's where your Arsenal and your Tottenham comes in. Tottenham, maybe not so much as Arsenal, but Arsenal just have a history where they have fan bases in... Asia, for example, I think a lot of people don't even realize this. The reason why the Premier League is so successful is because they have a huge fan base all around the world, and these people watch the games at all times of the all times of the day. And the biggest financial gain or the biggest financial um, uh, pit that the Premier League makes its money from is Asia. So I was in Asia for a couple of months, and I was you realize now the reason they play, for example, their games in the UK at twelve o'clock in the afternoon is not necessarily because of tradition. Okay, let me go on a tangent and explain something, right? So people wonder why the uh, Premier League is so successful. And it's not necessarily because of how they play all that stuff, right? You got to look at it this way. You know how when you watch like the big derbies in Europe, if we're talking, let's say, Real Madrid and um, Barcelona, Bayern Munich and Dortmund, or, um, you know, if I go to Biagos, I plan in Iagos, or if we're looking at uh, Inter and Juventus and all these things, right? These games in Europe are normally played at what's called prime time. Prime time means that this is the time when people are at home, relaxed, and they've done everything that they need to do for the day on the weekend, and they're just sitting at home and watching television, or it's dinner time, stuff like that, right? It's seven, between 7 o'clock and 9 p.m., sometimes maybe even 10 p.m. if you go as far as Spain. The Premier League said no, they'll play those games at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, their time. And the reason why they do that is because now they become the only source of entertainment in three different continents. So in Europe, they're the only teams that are playing at that time of day. So every team or every country in Europe is watching them, right? So you have those te- those television revenues. Like even I know when we played, when we were playing, for example, we'd be watching Premier League games before we went to play our own games because that's how early they were playing. That's one. Two, if you look at the African continent, they're also playing, at say, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, those times. So they're they are now the only source of the highest source of football entertainment in that continent, and the biggest revenue stream is Asia. They are playing at the Asian prime time, so they're playing twelve o'clock in the UK time, which is seven, eight, nine p.m. Asian time. So they are now they've made themselves prime time television in the Asian market. This is where their money is coming from. And it's something that now slowly other leagues tried to implement it, but it's just, it's so traditionally bought into other countries to play these big games at their own prime time that it's become almost impossible to implement. It's become like they tried, I think, one time to play uh, Barcelona against Real Madrid at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It just felt like it was completely insane. But it's because it's the only time that this is prime time in Asia. Because if you start to play your games at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock European time, this is 4 or 5 o'clock in Asia, nobody's watching it anymore. And by the time you wake up, you just look into your phone, you see the results, there's no need for you to watch the game again. Now, it might be good time, for example, in the U.S. or in, in North America, in the Americas, okay? And that's why the Spanish League is so popular in the Americas. Also, if you look at South America, it's popular there, obviously, because of the whole Spain connection. But... The revenue that they make there is not the same as the, the revenue that they're making in Asia. And this is what happened. The UK catered to Asia. Other countries are catered to Europe, their own countries, and then, uh, let's say, the Americas. So I need to make that caveat to keep going. So teams like Arsenal, teams like Tottenham, or all the teams in the Premier League, they make so much money. Their television deal is so big because of that. But these teams then bet too much on the fact that their history would be able to give them a chance to always be competing. And then they started spreading their money to other places rather than in the footballing side of things. So look at Arsenal and Tottenham. Both teams just bought, built new stadiums, right? So you're talking about hundreds of millions of euros spent on that or pounds, whatever you want to call it. And then uh, both of them have 
been building teams or at least have been spending money to a certain extent more Tottenham than maybe Arsenal but they've been spending money trying to at least then live up to the glory that they need to in order to have a larger market share in these Asian in the Asian market or even in North American markets because US US also is a big watcher of Premier League football so when it doesn't work out it costs money and if it doesn't work out one year, it costs money. Two years, it costs money. And people don't, also don't realize that Arsenal was always really happy to keep Arsene Wenger alive because he always somehow squeezed them into the Champions League and always kept this kind of prestige within the club that they, they could always claim themselves to be one of the top six clubs in, in the UK. And in doing so, then they always had a large market share in, in the Asian market. And this ties down to, you know, everything that you do. You're buying T-shirts, you're buying... You know, everything that has to do with a team saying that they have a, they have a large market share or that their fans have a reason to buy their products. And this is what it comes down to also. Like when you win a championship, people buy your products to celebrate the one that you won a championship and you make money off of this. So the more that you win, you don't only win prize money, you win money from your fan base as well. And they Arsenal has been depleted all of that with a new stadium. And now you have a new stadium where you're asking people to pay more money for, for tickets, but you're losing or you're not playing very well and people start to get frustrated. And then less people start coming and then you have a mediocre atmosphere in your stadium. And the next thing you know, everybody just, just have a, everybody starts going, playing right so this is what arsenal has been dealing with and this is what tottenham has realized they're, they're going in the same direction they thought they were fixing that by making the champions league final last year or the year before that and then everything just crashed and now they're they're desperate for money and then uh same thing if you look at the italian teams Ital italy has been struggling now uh, mostly because same thing they never really had a great foothold in viewership outside of italy so they don't have a lot of money that's coming in from China. They don't have a lot of money coming from Asia. They don't have a lot of money coming in from uh, from uh, North American market base. So they're thinking to themselves, yeah, how can we make money now in modern day football? Because nobody's watching the Italian league. But they also realize when we play against the other top teams in Europe, people are interested in watching us. You saw what happened, for example, when Cristiano Ronaldo went to Juventus. The stock market price of the Juventus skyrocketed and this is part of the reason why they brought him in they figured, okay if we bring him in here the guy's got what, over 160 million followers on instagram or whatever we're gonna have a whole bunch of people watching us and then hopefully that will be able to generate more revenue it didn't work out because <clears throat> you know there's a difference between uh cristiano ronaldo playing for real madrid in a classical than cristiano ronaldo playing for juventus in uh, against inter milan even you know it's not as many people are going to want to watch that because uh, the competition, the level of competition is not as high or is not as um, marketable as it is when he was playing at Real Madrid. <laughs> so they're losing a lot of money. You have all these teams that are losing a lot of money. And then the same thing goes for uh, Barcelona and uh, Real Madrid. They've both spent an incredible amount of money. Like Barcelona, being that it's the team that I follow, they did the worst. Like they went and sold uh, Neymar for $200 million. We didn't necessarily sell him, but he, they had to let him go because his clause got bought out. So for 200 plus whatever million, right? And they're thinking to themselves, okay, we have to replace him right away with somebody because we have to stay competitive. We can't let our fan base believe that we're just selling players in order to not be competitive. And on top of that, in order to keep, make sure that Lionel Messi is happy, we got to stay competitive. So what do they do? They go ahead and they try to buy a player right away. But Everybody else in Europe knows that you have a plus two hundred million euro cash, two hundred million euro cash pocket in your, in your, uh, in your finances. So they're gonna charge you up the ass. So Dortmund charges them one hundred and twenty or whatever it was million euros for uh, Dembélé, and then basically any other player that they want to buy, they have to pay more than they would if they if they hadn't done that. I mean, for them, ideally would have been, okay, Neymar was sold. Nobody knows how much he was sold for, and now you're still buying players at the same market rate that they were they were being sold for before because ev but because everybody knew then like i said it just skyrocketed the price of every other player and then on top of that everybody knows that every premier league team uh, earns a certain amount of money so if a premier league team comes to france to buy a player then that french team knows hey you guys got a lot of money you got to pay us up the ass for a player that's why you have manchester city paying 50 million euros or liverpool paying 50 million euros for a defender not even an attacking player. This is a defender. These are world record uh, sales that are being made for players that normally don't cost uh, uh, for figures in that, in that amount. So teams are investing, we'll call it investing a lot of money to bring their fan base's success. And this is what happens. So as far as they're concerned as owners, they're investing for their fan bases because what they could do is just take that money 
and either reinvest it in things that make the owners money, like take the money out or whatever, or try and please the fan bases, they put money into the club. So as far as they're concerned, they're doing things for the fan bases, right? Like, I'm sorry if I'm just dragging on. This is something that I follow closely, even though I'm just rambling. Like I'm rambling at the top of my head. This is something that I had written down or anything. I just figured I'll just turn the camera on and talk. So <clears throat> these clubs have invested a lot of money. And it hasn't been working out. And then they were investing all this money when things were still kind of on the up and up. You know, you could always have fans that were coming to the stadiums. You could always have merchandise that was being bought. People were working. There's still a, an ecosystem where money was being, you know, made and lost, made and lost, made and lost. And then, like I said, comes the pandemic and then phew, everything just skyrockets down. And these guys are desperate because they're thinking to themselves, what are we going to do now? And so, like Florentino Perez said, then for them, they're, he says they're saving football, but in, in the end, they're saving themselves from the mistakes that they've been making or for the, from the decisions that they've been making the last few years because they could have made other decisions that would have not put them in, this, in the position that they're in, which will bring you to the reason why teams like Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund are able to survive a pandemic and still be okay because they were cost efficient, if you want to call it that. They made sure that they didn't overpay for players. They made sure that they <laughs> invested more of the money that they received from the players that they sold or whatnot in places where they could be able to buy or get players for cheaper. You're talking about their youth system. You're talking about, for example, investing in players before they become the hottest player in uh, in, in football. Well, the best example I can give right now, because off the top of my head, because he's Canadian, is Davies. So they paid, I think it was 17 or 20 million euros for him. Now, technically speaking, because he's performed at a high level, at the highest level, he's worth maybe four or five times that in, in the current market, or not in the current market, in the market, let's say before the pandemic, maybe even 10 times that at the age that he is and with the way that he's performing. And if, if Barcelona, for example, after the game where in Champions League where he played really well against Barcelona, if Barcelona says, hey, you know what, we need this player at our life at our left back. Now they can say, to, uh, Bayern Munich can say to... Um, to Barcelona, well, you got, we'll charge you 170 million, million euros for him. It's possible. It was possible, at least at that time. And this is the difference. <clears throat> There's teams that are strategically planning how they use their finances to make their teams better. And there are teams that are just financially trying to make their teams better, hoping that it works out. And this is where you land in now. And we're not going to talk, for example, about how ownership works in uh, football teams that are outside of, let's say, Germany. In Germany, it's very difficult for one person to have complete ownership of a team where he makes or he or she makes all the financial decisions. Whereas in the UK, they felt they figured that was their saving grace because it was very difficult for them to find people that were willing to put in the amount of money that was necessary to run the leagues the way that they were being run. So they're having people like, for example, Leicester City. Leicester City won their championships off the backs of somebody who basically invested a lot of money in the club at the time. It was good strategic uh, strategic investing, mind you, but it was still a lot of money that they otherwise wouldn't have had if somebody wouldn't have been in there to dump all that money in there. That doesn't happen in Germany. So people look at, for example, the German league and say, yeah, well, it's kind of mediocre here and there, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's stable because everybody has a chance to give and take from what they've built. Whereas the way that they've built things in the UK it's based on how it's set up. If one person owns the place, then he has the opportunity to give and take based on how he pleases. So that's why Chelsea all of a sudden became a huge powerhouse in, in the UK. Manchester City is all of a sudden a huge power in the UK. So the power, like the, the, the power always shifts within the league, which is good for entertainment. But then people are now seeing what can happen on the flip side of it if things don't work out for a particular owner who's now disgruntled because he's thinking, okay, you know, I'm losing too much money. I got to figure out ways to make money. So that's the side of the owners, right? <clears throat> now we got to look at the other side of the fans. So the fans side of it is this. <clears throat> Most people who follow their clubs or who are in love with clubs that are close to their heart, that are, let's say, built in the communities that they're grown in or built within their families, that they're, their history. Their, I'll speak about Ike, for example, as an Ike member. <clears throat> Ike is a club that was built over 100 years ago in a country outside of where they play now by people that represented the country they live in in another country. And they built a community around this team and that community and that team went wherever they went. So fast forward over 100 years later, they are now something that generates revenue for that, uh, let's say, group that they've built. They generate their own revenue and the followers 
go and support them to get a sense of pride in what they own in a sense and give money to that uh, that club and that club uses that money then to finance their <clears throat> you know whether they become successful or not and then you have the same issue you have an owner now who invests a lot of money based on the love that he feels or he is now connect he feels as a connection to the fan base that he has and that money is invested to help this team become successful now same problem i is now you know the, the owner is probably losing a lot of money so he's now thinking to himself, okay how can i how can i generate money or what else what is the next step for him to do in order to try and either balance between generating money or not losing as much money and also trying to be successful it's not easy it's really not easy but for the fans <clears throat> the way they see it they've given you something that they've built so they've handed it to you or sold it to you if you decide to purchase it and with the intent that you're going to make it better but not take it away from them. And this is where it becomes a catch-22 because <clears throat> these teams that are, uh, are moving away from the Super League, they're doing two things. One, they're taking that ownership away from anybody that is a fan because now the decisions that happen with these teams no longer benefit them whatsoever. And two, they take away the most important part of what football has become in Europe. Football in Europe has become an interconnected system in every country in Europe that's involved in, in UEFA. It's an interconnected system of teams that are all connected from the top team in the top league to the bottom team in the bottom league because there's a chance, although a very slight chance, that the team at the very top could also end up being the team at the very bottom and the team at the very bottom could also end up being the team at the very top and this is all through the relegation and promotion system right so you have a relegation and promotion system in every single league that is played within europe whether even if you're talking about europa league if you're talking about champions league if you're talking about domestic leagues and so on and then obviously there's the cups that allow teams that are playing in different leagues to be able to play each other within a season and so on and so forth if you don't understand how cups work it's just going to take too long with this whole video point being that what the year what this proposed super league is doing is it's now breaking away from that ecosystem and creating its own system where you can only be there if you're asked to be there you don't necessarily have to earn it you don't have to there's no link that can get you there in a certain amount of years or get you there with this and that stuff it's just a matter of okay you know what and from the owner's perspective they're just choosing teams that have big fan bases they're not necessarily choosing the best teams or maybe they chose the best teams just the best teams aren't necessarily there like i said Bayern Munich is one of the best teams in europe without a doubt they're not necessarily there and even teams that are playing in other countries that are that can be considered the best teams in europe are not there either they're choosing the teams that have the biggest fan bases like i said if you're talking about europe you're talking about asia you're talking about north america africa south america these teams have the biggest fan bases in the world and that's why they're intentionally choosing these teams to go ahead and play in this system so that they can generate all the money from their fan bases so the rest of these fan bases are basically cut off they have no hope no chance of ever being in a position to generate that type of money so even if these teams that are playing in this league still continue to play in their own leagues they're putting themselves in a position where they're unfairly generating even more money than they would be if they were in that same ecosystem as everybody else where they have the same opportunity to generate the same amount of money that anybody else could if they were playing as good as they are of course it depends on how you invest that money that you win whether you're successful or not but that's the beauty of the whole thing unless the city can invest better than a uh, uh, Manchester City or Manchester United and can become champions of the league and then generate a large amount of money and now they've gone from a team that's from, from two or three divisions down to a team that's constantly on the upper half of the Premier League table because they've invested their money properly and they've done things that they needed to do to make sure that they stay competitive. So this opportunity is lost on every level because nobody knows what the criteria is for how you even get invited into the league nobody knows well people now know there's no criteria for being kicked for being relegated from the league there's no criteria for being promoted into the league it's just a select group of teams that have come together and privately met up to say we're going to break away from this ecosystem that involves everybody and create our own ecosystem because we need money 
So, and then the question becomes, well, somebody might ask for them, well, why don't they feel like they're getting enough money from Champions League, for example? The thing is, in Champions League, as much as us Europe, or people that are living in Europe see it as a great league where people are, or team, the best teams play each other, so to speak, it's an opportunity for teams that come from countries where they're not so, they don't have such a huge fan base, so they're not so historically great or don't have a lot of money to create better teams, where they still have a chance to compete against these, these let's say, A-level teams. They have a chance to compete against them. But in order to do that, you have to have then games that are not going to be as interesting to the viewers. And this is where Florentino Perez has a point, if you want to say that, for Real Madrid... It's not a revenue stream to go and play against uh, Sparta, I don't know, uh, Bel- Partizan Belgrade, for example, uh, where there's a chance, that there's a high chance that they're going to win anyway. So their fan bases don't tune in to watch that to watch the game. Like you said, the younger generation doesn't necessarily watch the games on tablets or whatever. So they don't watch those games. They just watch what the result is to see if their team won or not, and it's it's expected that the teams are going to win. And this is also another thing that makes that kind of draws people off from watching. There's an expectation: that, okay, this team is going to win, therefore I don't need to watch this game. They're going to watch the games where the two teams that are close to, either close to home or close to each other in the higher in the higher echelon of of, of football. As, of football, let's say for example, Bayern Munich is playing Partizan Belgrade and Chelsea is playing Bayern Munich. People are going to watch Chelsea against Bayern Munich rather than uh, Real Madrid and Partizan Belgrade. Because you don't know exactly who's going to win between Chelsea and Bayern Munich, but you're pretty sure that Real Madrid is going to win. So that game draws less revenue than the other game, and they're, this is what they're doing now. They're doing analytics and say, yeah, well, obviously people want to watch the teams that are on a higher level play against each other. So if we do that more often, everybody's going to uh, everybody's going to watch these games. We're going to make we're going to make more money. The thing that even they're failing to realize, though, from the owner's standpoint, is that when it becomes redundant when you play too many of these games and it also becomes a foregone, foregone conclusion who's going to win because if you're talking about games between let's say uh, Real Madrid and Arsenal Real Madrid and Tottenham Bayern Munich and Tottenham Bayern Munich and Arsenal it's also a foregone conclusion that Bayern Munich is going to win or Real Madrid is going to win so people are also going to be equally drawn off from watching these games and they're just going to be like oh, okay yeah fine and that's, that's only one thing the second thing is though once you've had enough games and the season has come to a point where you know where each team lands, it becomes an exhibition game because the teams at the bottom no longer have an incentive to win because they know, okay, it doesn't matter if we win or not, we're not going to lose anything. We're not going to lose revenue. We're not going to lose our status. We're not going to lose anything other than just 90 minutes that we have to go there and play. So they'll start playing, for example, with their reserve players or even Real Madrid. If they know, okay, yeah, we don't have to win this game because we're already at the top, we're already in the playoff or whatever. Okay, we'll just send our reserve team in there. And then you just have a diluted, high-quality game. And what this is what a lot of people are now complaining about. You're putting these very special occasions in a position where... They, they happen so much that they become diluted and start to mean nothing. And you have the same situation that you have in all the other leagues, just in a higher level. And this is what happens when you do that, when you put these teams all together. And this is the main reason why not having an interconnected link between all these leagues, this is the main reason why having it is very important. Because when you do have it, then there's always a reason you need to play. You need to play to either make sure you you stay at the top or you don't go to the bottom. And this is what is going, this is what people mean when they say it's the death of football. It's the death of the part of the game that allows every single game to mean something to somebody. So if it's a team that, let's say, you know, if you look at it within the leagues, it doesn't mean a lot to the average football fan who's not within these European countries who follows these teams avidly. Fine, it doesn't mean a lot to them, the Asians, the North Americans. It doesn't mean a lot to them if Sassolo, for example, is playing for relegation. So, But if Sassolo is playing against uh, Juventus and they're playing against relegation and Juventus is playing for, uh, for the championship, it's a big game to everybody involved in that ecosystem. To the Asians community, or whatever it's probably not that not important. Okay, it's just Juventus is playing a team that they should be beating anyways. But within those small ecosystems, you have games that have a lot of meaning. 
So every small ecosystem has that. If you have Cardiff playing against, I don't know, whatever. But in the UK, you have uh, teams that are in, in the bottom part of the UK league. They're playing against teams that are in the top six or in the, in the top. Everybody's playing for position. You're jockeying for position. And it's, never, it's a never-ending jockeying or a never-ending um, never drama that will continue to always be there in that small ecosystem. It's just that the Premier League has put themselves in a position where they have a larger ecosystem because they have a larger fan base around the world. But that's just the way it is. If we're talking in Greece, you're talking about even Ike is my team that went down. They went down to, I think it was the third division. It happens. And then they had to work their way back up. But this is what makes... This is the drama that creates the passion that you see in European football. And without it... It is then what people are calling the death of football. So, like I said, I, I felt like it was necessary to try and present both sides of the, uh, of the equation to try before people can form an opinion on it. My personal opinion is that I think people, like I said, need to come together with an open understanding of both sides and then try to find a solution. Yeah, there's teams that are been successful and they actually generate a lot of money, let's say, for the rest of the teams because you, you have to look at it. Like the, the teams that are big in a league are the reasons why. Let's say, let's say for the premiership. The teams that are big in the premiership are the reason why the premiership generates a lot of money because people watch them play and they watch them play against the rest of the teams in the league so the rest of the teams benefit from it. Same can kind of be said in Spain, although in Spain, I think it's Barcelona and Real Madrid take I think, 50% of the TV revenues. And then everybody else is kind of left to scatter with the rest. So it's a little bit unfair. But at the same time, if you look at the size of those teams compared to the rest of the teams in the league to the rest of the world, they generate a lot of the money that that league makes through television revenue. So it kind of makes sense, although it seems unfair. Same can be said in Italy and so on and so forth. So people need to take all of this into account. And then people need to come together and say, okay, yeah, this is what we need to do. And this is the same thing we're talking about with UEFA, same thing we're talking about with FIFA. By the way, I think it's ridiculous that they're saying that players that are playing in the Super League can't play in the World Cup and all that other stuff. It's, they're basically trying to force them not to do something that they don't have any control of, which is ridiculous. But that's just that's the politics that you're going to be seeing in all of this, and that's the way it is. There's nothing you can do about that. But um, like I said, it's just there's always two sides to the story. So people, I think, before they go and start shouting and yelling every single thing that there is to shout about every, every side of it, I think it's just always necessary to make sure you understand both sides of it and to understand that although football, the football, the way that we know it is as a, from a fan's perspective, it's pure. You want your team to win regardless of whatever the outcome is. You don't have actual physical ownership of it where you lose money based on what happens within the team. Because if you had that, then you might be thinking to yourself, hey, if there's a way that I can be able to generate money just by just by being there, sure, why not try it? But at the same time, there's a lot more to it than just what happens to the person that's making the money and what's not making the money. And whoever decides to buy into football the way it's made in Europe is aware of that. And not only should they be aware of that, they have to be willing to play within within the way the the rules have been set up for over 100 years in European football. So it's it's a catch-22 in a lot of ways, but at the same time, I think it's it's a, it's a an opportunity for people to kind of understand where, where football is as an economy and what needs to be done about it. And I think, and I got, I got to respect Bayern Munich. Like I, when I first came to Germany, I, used, I, was a, I was a Bayern Munich hater, but now I probably respect them more than yeah, any other club in Europe, even before this whole situation. And um, I think it's kind of hard to ruminate, they said it today. At the end of the day, people just got to cut costs. And that's what happened. And like I said, it was triggered with the whole PSG buying of Neymar, where costs just skyrocketed and everybody's just a huge arms race to see who they can get for how much and all these things. And people got to come back down to earth and say, you know what? The players don't cost that much. They don't generate that much. Like if a player doesn't generate you a certain amount of money over a certain time period, then he's not worth that much. That's just an evaluation given based on hype. And the hype's got to stop. Hype's got to stop. Salaries maybe have to come down, but I think more, more importantly is the, the asking prices for players. Transfer fees got to come, come got to come down exponentially, bro. Like salaries for the chosen few, yeah, they probably also got to come down, but definitely the 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 transfer fees. That's just 
it's too much it's way too much it's unsustainable it was always unsustainable and this is just a market crash this is a football market crash for anybody that follows the stock market it's a football market crash and they just got to reevaluate their entire system and yeah that's my vlog i don't know how long this is but yeah i didn't intend it to be this long but yeah you start getting me talking about football bro i'll talk i'll talk for a long time all right thanks for tuning in um catch the music when it comes out it's coming out soon <laughs> and all that and all that and then some all right peace saga boat